depth of those words, it is absolutely terrifying to me at the same time that all people on earth will be blessed through you. It was a promise that was originally given to Abraham, and it's a promise that extends uh, through the New Testament covenant to God's church today, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, I don't know um, if uh, you've read much uh, about finances and millionaires. Some of you maybe live that life here today, but I want to read to you an article from June of 2011 that stated that the number of millionaire households in the United States from 2010 to 2011 grew by 12.2 percent to 12 and a half million millionaire households. Those are defined as uh, those with one million dollars or more in investable assets excluding homes and excluding luxury goods and ownership of one's company. The U.S. continues to lead the world with millionaires. There's 5.2 millionaire households here in the United States. That is uh, followed by Japan, that is the next closest country with one and a half million millionaire families, uh, trailing them as as, uh, China with 1.1 million, and then the United Kingdom with 570,000. Singapore, of all countries, leads the world with a population of millionaire uh, density. So if you live in Singapore, chances are, uh, well, 15.5% of the households in Singapore are millionaire households. That is an incredible number. According to the report, the world's world's millionaires represent overall population 0.9%. So nine-tenths of 1% of the people in the world today uh, would qualify as, as millionaire households. So less than 1%. The millionaire households in the world control 39% of the world's wealth. That is extraordinary when you consider that number, up from 37% in 2009. Those with $5 million or more uh, represent 0.1% of the population, one-tenth of 1%. Um, of the population are those with $5 million or more and that type of wealth control 22% of the world's wealth up from 20% in 2009. Millionaires control 29% of North America's wealth while millionaires control about 38% of the wealth in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, The most current data supports a trend that has been demonstrably visible for years, the rise of the global winner-take-all economy. I want to step back for a moment and say that I don't think the Lord has anything against those who are millionaires. In fact, I think that God has blessed many who are millionaires to be a blessing in the lives of others. He has uh, done incredible things. When you look at the statistics of the wealth of the evangelical church around the world, the numbers are almost um, embarrassing. They are staggering. It is embarrassing how much God has blessed his church with. It almost looks like it's not fair. And I I believe that it requires ourselves to ask a question. And the question is, why? Why has the Lord entrusted his church with so much wealth? And I believe with all of my heart that it is because God has forever had the plan to use his people, his chosen people, his church, as the number one blessing for, uh, number one instrument of blessing to the people of planet Earth. I wonder if you think about that, uh, and if you think that's true about you, that you're part of something that God says, listen, my church, my people, those that I've called, are to be the number one source of blessing here in the world. Every week in this series, I've begun by asking you a question that I'm going to ask you again today. How many of you consider yourselves to be blessed? Okay, most of you, almost 100% of you now at this point say, yeah, I'm blessed, all right? And then when I ask you, how many of you would consider yourselves exceedingly blessed when in compared to the rest of the world, almost all of you, again, raise your hands because it's true, right? Uh, when you look at the rest of the world, we, we saw last week that the, uh, more than ha- almost half the people in the world today live on less than $1,000 a year. And so when, when you look at those statistics, they are staggering. And we've got to ask ourselves, as people who are Christians who live in the most blessed country in all of the world, uh, why has God given us so much? And what is it that God wants us to do with the blessing that he's given to us? I want you to take a look at Proverbs chapter 22, 9. And this is from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, he who has a generous eye will be, what? Say that with me blessed, all right? He who has a generous eye will be blessed 
for he gives of his bread to the poor. Throughout Scripture, you see this principle of the person who has a generous eye being somebody that God blesses. And I wonder if that's a description of you this morning. Some of you have an eye for talent. Maybe you're a coach. We've got a lot of basketball coaches at our church, a lot of basketball coaches, a lot of, a lot of hockey coaches. And some of you, you've got a natural eye for talent, all right? You can tell whether somebody's a D1 prospect, okay? You can tell whether or not somebody is going to be playing basketball in college. You can tell whether or not somebody's going to get any playing time whatsoever on your team based on what you see about the way that that person handles a basketball. Some of you have an incredible sense of style. You have an eye for style. When you walk out of the, mor- the, the house in the morning, you are always put together. You're the person that people come up to and they say, you look great today. In fact, you look great every day. And they, they come to you for shopping advice. They want you to take them with you, you, you take you with them when they go shopping. And it's just this amazing thing. Some of you have an eye for food. You're a foodie, all right? And, and you've got an eye for food. When people want a restaurant recommendation, They come to you. And and it doesn't matter where because you've been to restaurants all over the world. So they're going to London and they're going to your Facebook page on the new Facebook graph. And they're going to type in restaurants that so-and-so liked in London because that's where they're going to go eat that night. Or maybe you're a gourmet chef. And when they're going to have a dinner party at their house, they're coming to you, you with the eye for food, because you cook these gourmet meals that are so incredible. And they know they're going to impress whoever their guests are, if they'll just follow your instructions on how to cook that meal. And you know what? Some of you may have that eye for whatever else it is that we mentioned there, but you've also got the eye that the Bible talks about here. You've got a generous eye this morning. And you're the person who, you're having conversations with your spouse, and you're saying, you know, the Lord's blessed us so much. How can we be a blessing in somebody else's life? Or you hear about a need, and and you're just... It excites you when you hear about the need because you're ready to do something about it. You're continually looking for how you can be a blessing in the lives of others. And what Proverbs 29, 22.9 tells us is that you're somebody that God is going to continue to bless. Because the person with the generous eye, Scripture tells us, is a person who's blessed. And I hope that every one of us would say, okay, God, if that's a description of somebody who's blessed, I want to be that type of a person. I want to be a generous person. And here's the deal. That's what God's church, that's what the bride of Christ has been known for, for for generations. In fact, for centuries. The earliest Christians were known as being some of the most exceedingly generous people on the planet. In 2004, Alvin Schmidt published the book, How Christianity Changed the World. It's a book that I want to recommend to anybody to read. It is, it is a fabulous read about how the church transformed society, how these early followers of Jesus Christ who followed a peculiar teaching and a peculiar man who claimed to be God uh, changed history. One of the first arenas that the church changed society in was in the treatment of women. So many times uh, the church is uh, portrayed wrongly on this. Almost every society had oppressed women up until the time that the church was founded. Christianity elevated women. The church's teachings on sexual morality began to change the way that women were treated. The church also uh, had an impact on the way that the poor were taken care of. When Christians began to live out the Jesus message, Christians could no longer ignore the poor and the marginalized in society. It's one of the reasons that the church In Reach 15, we've said that we're going to take seriously the words of Jesus as it relates to widows and orphans, the oppressed, the prisoners, and and the refugee. That we're going to care about the marginalized in society because that's what the church has always done. The book shows that prior to Christianity, Greeks and Romans had little or no interest in the poor, the sick, or the dying. If you were poor, sick, or dying, it was almost as if you had a death sentence on you. But the early Christians followed the example of their master. Jesus, and they ministered to the needs of the whole person. During the first three centuries of the church, they could only care for the sick where they found them because the church was being persecuted at that age. And so if they were going to care for somebody, it had to be right there on the spot, do what they can, because there was no way that they could create a system in which they would care for the poor because they were an oppressed people. But once the persecution subsided, the institutionalization of health care began in earnest. And it began in the church. 
For example, the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325 directed bishops to establish hospices in every area that had a cathedral. So if there was a cathedral in a city, the Christians in that city began hospices to care for those who were ill. The very first hospital was created and built by St. Basil in Caesarea in 369. And by the Middle Ages, hospitals covered all of Europe and even beyond that. In fact, Christian hospitals were the world's very first charitable institutions. The church uh, was the first to take care of the mentally ill. Nursing began in earnest because of Christian care for the sick. So if you're a nurse today, the very roots of your profession come from the church and come from the church caring for the needs of others. A review of this book says that education, while important in Greek and Roman culture, really took off institutionally under the influence of Christianity. The early Greeks and the Romans had no public libraries or educational institutions. It was Christianity that established these. As discipleship was important for the first believers and those to follow, early formal education arose from Christian uh, catechal schools. Unique to Christian education was the teaching of both sexes. So it was Christians who were the first to allow women to be educated alongside of men. Ladies, if you have a college degree today, if you're able to go to high school, if you're able to go to a grammar school, a grade school, a junior high, you have the church to thank for that because it was something that didn't happen before the church began to open educational endeavors for both males and females. Also a church distinctive, individuals from all social and ethnic groups were included. There was no bias on ethnicity or class, and the concept of public education first came from the Protestant Refor Reformation. Moreover, the rise of the modern university is largely the result of Christian educational endeavors. The book goes on to talk about the impact that Christianity had on the dignity of laborers, on the arts and the sciences, in our own nation, and the formation of our government. And it talks about so much more. The bottom line, as Schmidt notes, is that if Jesus Christ had never been born to, sp that to speak of Western civilization as we know it today, would be incomprehensible. Indeed, there may never have been such a civilization. The freedoms and the benefits that we enjoy in many modern cultures are directly due to the influence of Jesus Christ. Christians have made many mistakes. There's no question about it. There have been many times that the Christian church in the centuries that followed was on the wrong side of history. But Christians have also achieved many great things, all because of the one whom they follow. Listen, Christianity changed the world because of love and because of generosity. When we love the way that God loved us, the world can't help but take notice. And that's who we want to be as a church. That's why we're taking time over these weeks to talk about this area of finances and what it is that we do with the blessing God has done to us because how we respond in that area makes a difference for eternity. Two weeks ago, we looked at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus was talking about giving. And in the verse, he says this. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. If you weren't with us two weeks ago, we said this is an agrarian society that Jesus is teaching to. Would it make complete sense to those who were there in the day? Because what happened in those days is laborers would work the fields of the masters who owned these fields. And the laborers would do their day's work and they might fill up a basket three quarters of the way full of the grain. And they were content to carry a basket that was pretty full, but they didn't want it completely full because that gets a little bit heavy. And so they filled it as much as they felt like filling it and as much as the master would let them and they'd walk out. Those who were not laborers, though, those who depended upon the charity and the love of the master, those who needed the grain from those fields to, to, to feed their family, they had a very different approach. So at the end of the day, the master would say, hey, help yourself to my fields. Bring a basket. Fill what you can. And so as they filled the basket, they pressed down that grain as far as they could press it down. And then they'd put some more grain in. They'd, they'd press it down even more to the point where the basket was overflowing. And they might even need somebody else to help them carry that basket to be able to leave because they were putting that basket together, not for the person who owned the vineyard, but to feed their family. 
And this mattered to them. And Jesus said, that's what it's like. That's what the Heavenly Father wants to give to you. This blessing that is good, that is pressed down, that is shaken together. Make more room for more grain in here. Press it down even more so it's running over into your lap. That's the kind of blessing that God wants to give to his people. We see that when we're generous, we're blessed. Jesus says it all over Scripture. This verse doesn't necessarily mean that God's only going to bless us with monetary blessings. But what's promised to us is God's blessings. And you're going to see in a little bit that those blessings actually extend way beyond monetarily. Craig Rochelle says, here's the bottom line. Our enemy, Satan, cannot stop the blessings of God. It's a principle. If you sow, you will reap. When you give, you will be blessed. You can't stop the blessings of God. But here is what Satan can do. He can try to distort our relationship with the blessings of God. And this, he says, is what I believe Satan is very good at doing, distorting our relationship and the understanding of the blessings of God. And so he shared with his congregation two very distorted views that many of us have when it comes to the blessings of God, that which the Lord has blessed us with. Two mindsets. The first of the mindsets is pride. It's this mindset of pride. Some of us have experienced God's blessing in ways that we could have never even dreamt about when we were growing up. And instead of responding in a way that is appropriate, instead of responding and saying, Lord, thank you for how you've blessed me. Now use these gifts uh, as, as I give them back to you. We, we've, we've made it all about us. We've got this mindset of pride. Revelation 3.17, Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea, a church that had been exceedingly blessed, much like us. And he says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, what an indictment on the church at Laodicea. These were people who were proud of what they had, but had forgotten the source of that which they had been blessed with. You see, people with the mindset of pride use the word I a lot. These are the people that you'll hear say things like, well, I'm blessed because I've worked so hard. I mean, I, I have done incredible things. I have put in amazing hours. I, have, I, have, I deserve this. I deserve a life of luxury. I'm entitled to it. And if others just had a better work ethic, well, they could be living the life that I'm living. I have arrived. And it's this, you, you can hear it, the pride in their voice. But you know what? You don't have to be wealthy to struggle with the sin of pride when it comes to money. In fact, there are many who have very little who like to say things like, well, if I had money, I mean, if God were to bless me like he blessed that millionaire down the street, I'd do much better things with it. I can't believe how they waste their money. I can't believe the things they spend their money on. And if I just had more, if God was not so stingy in my life, life would be better. I deserve more. How could God bless selfish materialists like them and not bless me? I'd do a much better job with it. And it's still pride. People who struggle with pride have forgotten that every blessing that we have has been provided to us by God. There's a second wrong response that Groeschel talks about. It's this response of shame. For some of it, it's not that we're proud of the money we have. We're actually almost kind of ashamed of it. And we're kind of embarrassed about the fact that God has blessed us. In Genesis chapter 32, 9 and 10, Jacob was somebody that had this mindset. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all these deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. You can almost hear the shame. You can almost hear Jacob saying, I'm embarrassed by all that you've given to me, God. Groeschel gives the following insight. He writes, pride and shame. You've got, a, you've got those who'd say, I earned it, I deserved it, and others who would say, actually, I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't deserve this. I feel very embarrassed. And you can see these two play out if you compliment something that someone has. Suppose someone says to you, hey, I like your shirt. The proud person says, oh, yeah, me too. I, mean, I got it at such and such a store. It's this designer. It's beautiful. And oh, I just, I just love it. And it goes on and on and on about the shirt that you just complimented. All right. The person who struggles on the other side here with a little bit of shame will say, oh, this shirt, this old thing, I, I got it half price. And, you know, goodwill. And it's no big deal. And, you know, I, I'm almost embarrassed to have it. Or, or maybe you compliment uh, the car that this person has. And they say, oh, you know, it's just a 2009 such and such. And, and you know, it's a company car. 
uh, no, no big deal, you know, or, 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 or maybe um, you say, I like your house, and the prideful person says, well, yes, well, we, we built it ourselves, we got the best designer, and these are granite countertops, and it's got this and this, and they would go, oh, no, nah, I'm talking about their house. The person who struggles with shame might say, oh, it's nothing, we, we got it on an auction. I know it's worth 750000 but it was a foreclosure, we got it at three seventy five. dollars it's no, no big deal, all right, so don't make a big deal about my house. This is what Groeschel says, he says, what's interesting to me is this, I don't know any other area of blessings from God that people are ashamed of except for material blessings and financial blessings. He says, they might be out there, but I can't think of any. If someone were to say to me, Craig, you're blessed with a great wife, I just say, thank you, I am. I don't say, oh no, I got her for half price. She was really cheap. He doesn't say that about his wife. He says, if somebody says to Craig, uh, uh, Craig, you've got great kids. He doesn't say, Oh, no, no, really, two of them are demon-possessed at home. I mean, they're just terrible. They're, they're all... No, he says, yes, God's blessed me. And yet, for some reason, when it comes to this area, there's either pride or there's shame. There's, I feel guilty. I, I don't know about you, but most of us in earth have one of these feelings uh, from time to time when it comes to what God has blessed us with. And both are unhealthy. And yet, it's where so many people live in the area of God's blessing. Chances are you find yourselves struggling with one of these responses from time to time. And, and I believe with all of my heart that that is one of the devil's schemes to hinder Christians from experiencing the joy that God has for us. These two attitudes toward wealth hinder so many of us living with the generous eye that's described throughout Scripture. Some of you have been on the extre- receiving end of extravagant love from someone who has much less than you. Maybe you're on a mission trip, and I told the story a couple of weeks ago about the people who gave me Coke, and they had Cokes for everybody on our team, and as we're leaving and going down the mountain, the missionary said, they won't be eating dinner tonight, because that cost them more than a day's wages. I remember when I was in college, I was going to go on a mission trip to Hawaii, and uh, some of you, it's like going to Florida in January, right? I mean, tough. But uh, I fought it, didn't want to go, and felt like God was saying, no, you're supposed to go, and a couple days before the trip, still had a large amount of money that was due. And I've told you the story before. God provided the day before the trip. What I haven't told you is who he provided through. And so one of my mentors growing up was the guy who led my high school ministry. He was a volunteer. We had four youth pastors in four years at my church. And he was kind of the, the glue in this youth ministry and just kind of what was there and built into us. And he was a blue-collar guy, worked for Service Master in Chicago. It was an organization that cleaned houses. Um, had so little. With the little that he did have, he was putting himself through flight school, learning to fly these little Cessnas because he wanted to be a missionary pilot. He felt like God was calling his family to serve overseas. And, and so this guy became a missionary when I was in college, and he was raising support to be a missionary himself, Bill Searing. And, uh, and I'll never forget a couple days before that trip, having this conversation with Bill. Bill was one of the guys who challenged me to go on the trip. Brian, you need to do this. This is something that God's going to do great things this summer through you. I said, Bill, I I'm just, I need you to pray for me. I don't have enough for this trip. And he pulls out his checkbook and he wrote the biggest check I received from anybody. You know, I, I lived in a very, very wealthy community with a church that was full of very, 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 very wealthy people but it was the service master missionary to be that wrote me the check. And I was embarrassed to take it from him. I said, Bill, no, 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 don't do this. You're, you're raising money. You, you need that money. Don't give me this money. He says, Brian, don't rob me of the gift of blessing you. God has blessed us. I want to bless you. And I'm saying, Bill, no, you don't have enough. Schulenberg, I got enough, all right? I'm writing you the check. This is my blessing. Let me do it. God's blessed me. I want to bless you. And that trip changed me in so many ways. It confirmed my call to ministry. I saw the Lord work through me evangelistically like I'd never seen. But so much of that was possible because of Bill in my life. They were happy to be a blessing like so many had been in their lives. Groeschel says, if you think, Groeschel says, I think it, it, it just must crush God when we're proud of what we have. When we say, I deserve this. Look, you don't deserve that, he says. Every good thing you have is a gift. Or on the other side, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed. Our good God says, I chose to bless you. 
He says the problem is when we have a dysfunctional relationship with the blessings and we start to think that we've earned them and they're all for us. Is that why God blessed you, really? So you could just keep it all for yourself? It's all for me. It's all for me. It's all for me. I want to challenge you to remember, Groeschel says, that because all of you have said you're exceedingly blessed, to remember why God blessed you. He didn't bless you because you deserve it or you earned it. He didn't bless you to make you feel bad. He blessed you with a purpose. I wonder if we understand what that purpose is. I wonder if we've taken time to study that. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11, the Apostle Paul said, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. It's this idea that, hey, God's promised, I'm going to bless my church. I'm going to bless those that I've called out. And I want you to be generous with what I've given you. Why? So ultimately, thanksgiving will be produced and given to God. So ultimately, God is going to be worshipped because of what it is that we do with what he's blessed us with. I shared with you that verse that was in the video, you know, those beautiful words that God is uh, going to allow us to be people, that all the people of earth will be blessed through. That wasn't just a nice videographer's words, okay? It comes from Genesis 12, 2 and 3. The Lord speaking to Abraham said, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whom who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. Put yourself in Abraham's spot for a second. Can you imagine what that conversation like with God was like? Hey, Abraham, I'm going to bless all the families, every family through earth because of you and the generations that follow you. That is extraordinary. And yet that's what God is saying to each one of us today. Because we're part of that. Yeah, some of you might say, well, I'm not Jewish. I'm not a descendant of Abraham. Okay, that's not me. But New Testament theology tells us, no, we were grafted in as his church. And that we are heirs to those promises as well. And to those responsibilities. And that God has called us to be a blessing as well to the people. And I told you about the blessing that the church has been. The blessing of the Jewish people Uh, through the generations to the world, the advancements that have come from those who came from the line of Abraham is absolutely stunning how this little tiny country that looks so insignificant in the Middle East could make such an impact and only be described through God and God's blessings upon them. It is an amazing promise that God would bless all the peoples of earth through us. We've been blessed to be a blessing to others. Groeschel puts it this way. Because God has blessed us with more, we will intentionally give more. Most of us respond to this blessing, or many of us respond to it by thinking about how we can strategically consume more. Okay, God, you've given us such great stuff. Now what can I spend it on? I'm ready to go buy a new car. I'm ready to get a, you know, my cabin upgrade. I'm ready to do this or do that. People who are generous understand that the more generous that we are, the more we experience God's blessing. Okay, very quickly, at the end of the service here, sermon here, I want to share with you three ways in Scripture that people are generous, all right? And number one is this, that you see spontaneous givers in Scripture. There's a great story in uh, Luke chapter 10 of the Good Samaritan one of the most unlikely of people to help a Jewish person who's hurt on the side of the road would have been a Samaritan. And yet the the Jewish folks, the religious leaders, the political leaders pass him by. The Samaritan sees this man who's been beaten, takes care of him. And in Luke 10.35, we read about his spontaneous giving. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. There was, uh, that, that was giving that wasn't planned, all right? He saw a need. He said, I'm going to meet this need. Come alongside. We, we talked about it the first week in the story of the boy with the fish and the loaves. Said, hey, not much, Jesus. You take it. You use it. Very spontaneous gift. And the truth is this. The spontaneous giving is important. And we need to be people who are prepared to give spontaneously, to move when we see a need and when there's action. I love that the Stevens ministry team, I think it was Cindy that said it, that God just seems to 
to, to, to be doing some amazing things in this church. And where there's a need, this church has responded in spontaneous ways and given to those needs, whether it's mission trips to Thailand or starting the Stevens ministry or other things. Spontaneous giving, though, is just one way to give. The Bible speaks about another type of giver, and that is a strategic giver. Here's, here's the problem with spontaneous giving sometimes. We're limited in what we can do in spontaneous giving right? Because we haven't planned for it, all right? So we give what we can. Sometimes we give above what we can, but it's not something we plan for. Strategic givers are the planners in the church. Isaiah chapter 32, 8 speaks of this type of giver. But generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. These are the people that talk about how they can be a blessing to others. These are the couples who actually sit down and say, Okay, God, you've blessed us with this. Now, how can we use it to be a blessing in the lives of others? These are the tithers in church. Last week, we, we talked about this principle. We said, I will give my first and my best to God so that he can bless the rest. These are the people that have picked out a percentage. They've said, we, we've strategized in 2012. We're going to give 10% to the Lord and, 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 and just trust that uh, by living that way, that God's going to bless us in the 90% that we get to keep for ourselves. There are some strategic givers who'd say, you know what, this year we're going to give an additional 2% to the Lord. There are some who are empty nesters who planned really well, and they are at a point in their life where maybe they are making more money than they made when their kids were at home. Their kids are gone and they're off, and yet they're still giving at that same level they've given at for years. And maybe God's saying, hey, listen, maybe I'm blessing you in a way that you can strategically give more to be a blessing to others. When we plan and prayerfully decide what to give, we can strategize on where to make an impact. And that's the type of giving that allows us to support God's work across the street and around the world. Generous people plan to be generous and you know what? Generous people will tell you it's one of the most wonderful blessings in their life. And it's all worth it. There's a third type of giver that Scripture talks about. And that's the sacrificial giver. These are people who don't just give the minimum. These are people who sometimes give until it hurts. You know, they, they feel like God has called them to give above and beyond. King David is a perfect example of this. In 2 Samuel 24, he's on his way to worship. He meets a guy named Arana. He wants to take this threshing floor that Arana has and, and, and make a tabernacle out of it and worship to the Lord right there and then. And this Aaronic guy, he, he's thrilled. The king of Israel has just come like to his town. And he says, well, let me give you some, some, some animals and you can sacrifice these and you can have my place. And, and like any of us would do if we knew tonight President Obama was going to come have dinner at our house and we'd say, I'm, I'm cooking the best dinner I can. I may not agree with all of his policy. Doesn't matter. The president's at my house and I'm going to make something great for him. All right. That's what Arana wants to do. But King David says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And in verse 24, the king says to Arana, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Sacrificial givers love to worship God through giving. They recognize that he's given them everything that they have, that they've been blessed with. They recognize that it's all his to begin with. Everything they had belongs to the Lord anyway. And so the sacrificial giver gives. You know what? Sacrificial givers don't have to be wealthy. So King David, exceedingly wealthy, more wealthy than any of you will probably ever be, okay? But then in the New Testament, you have this story of sacrificial giving from this poor widow. And look at what Jesus observes in Mark 12. And he sat down opposite the treasury. This is Jesus. And he watched the people putting money into the offering box. That's a little scary, huh? God is watching as they're giving their offerings. And many people, many rich people, put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she had and everything that she has to live on. This is a beautiful picture. She was as poor as could be gave what she had, gave sacrificially, believing and taking God at his word that when we're generous, he's going to take care of us. Do you think Jesus was thinking about that rich, I mean, that poor widow when she put her, her, her money in? What a fool. What's she going to buy her bread with tonight? What's she going to be able to, to, to purchase her meal with? Now, God's going to take care of her needs. I love what Groeschel says about this. It's sacrificial giving. You see, a lot of times people say, well, we really don't have much to give. 
And he says, no, 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 no. You always have got something to give. You've always got something that you can give. And when you have even less, that is when sometimes you can make the biggest sacrifice. I've seen um, people in my life make incredible sacrifices that I, I didn't expect to do so and seen God bless in great ways. So I was blown away. I was reading through Groeschel's sermon this week, and he and his wife Amy um, are, are pretty generous people. And he, pastor, he says they've lived by Dave Ramsey's principles kind of throughout their married life, and they, they did the financial peace thing early in their married life. And there's something Dave Ramsey says in Financial Peace University. He says, live today like no one else so that one day you can live like no one else. All right? So it's just this, this comment. Uh, that he makes. And so they decided we're going to do that. So for the first 10 years of their marriage, they bought only used clothes. They, they would buy stuff at Goodwill and Savers and, 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 and all the clothes they had were used. And he said, I couldn't wait until I could buy like a, an article of clothing that wasn't used. Pastor, all right? So he's just trying his best to live within his means. And all along, he says, though, they, they had determined that they didn't really want to do what Dave Ramsey said, to live today like no one else so that one day you could live like no one else. He says, we made this commitment that we wanted to live today like no one else so that one day we could give like no one else. They wanted to be people who would take what God has blessed them with and, and use it to be a blessing in the lives of others. So fast forward, Groeschel has now written a few books and you know God's blessed him and this ministry has grown. Today, this pastor is giving away 50% of what he makes every year and living on 50%. And he's living out of this principle. He, he, he scrimped and he saved and he did that, worked hard so that he could give like no one else. And I got to tell you, their church is following suit. I would love to get to that point. I, I really would love to get to the point someday where I could give like that. Today, um, their church uh, has been called by Brian Houston, who pastors Hillsong Church in Australia, uh, the most generous church in the world. Many of you have been using today even to follow along in the sermon, the little sermon note thing that we put together in the bulletin every day, the Bible app that's on your phone. 80 million people have downloaded this app. Uh, that's something their church produced, and they just give it away for free. They've hired three or four people now. That, that's their jobs full-time. Those people don't benefit Life Church one bit. They're a gift to the rest of the body of Christ. They hire other people who help produce all of the materials that they then give away to other churches. The graphic we've been using on the little bottom of the screen that this whole service came from their church. They, they, they just give it away. 45,000 churches last year downloaded materials from this church for free because they've understood that sacrificial giving makes a difference for the kingdom for eternity. So I hope you'll be generous with what God's blessed you with. Uh, a couple years ago, Jim Nigren shared a story with me that um, I thought fit in really well with today's sermon. So Jim's going to come up and finish. He's going to finish the sermon with a, a better sermon than I gave just now in three minutes or four minutes. So however long it takes, and read the whole thing because it's fantastic, all right? That's the problem of being in a small group with a pastor with a good memory. Um, anyway, it might happen for some of you too. Just want you to remember one number for the next few minutes. 4,600. Youth group, you got it? 4,600. All right. First payday in February is a great day for the employees at Ameriprise Financial. Um, around our house that Friday is known as Bonus Day. Before I talk about Bonus Day, however, let me give you a little insight into giving at the Nigren House. Like a lot of people, tithing was something that Liz and I kind of grew into. Taking 10% off the top of our monthly income, that was a hard thing to be able to do. We had good intentions, but it took us a little while to get there. And like Steve Olson talked about last week, it was a bit of a journey for us too. But after getting there, month after month and year after year, God has blessed us and provided for us what we've needed. And we've seen those provisions, and as we've seen them, it's gotten easier and easier to tithe. Anyway, back to bonus day. I love bonus day. My family loves bonus day. Every year I'd come home on bonus day and peel off a hundred bucks for Jason, a hundred bucks for Laura, and a few more than that for Liz, and say, happy bonus day. And they'd all be lying to you if they said they still didn't love bonus day, and two of those people don't even live at our house anymore. <laughs> I would use my bonus money for new car down payments, vacations, home improvements, tuition for the kids, new clothes, whatever 
I wanted to use that money for. Now, I told you that Liz and I were tithing, but we were tithing on our monthly income. Bonuses from Ameriprise were mine. I worked very hard for them, and I deserved them. And then God did something that changed all of that. Some of you who've been here for a while might recall that um, Teen Challenge would come in and periodically do Sunday morning services for us. They'd lead the, lead the singing, and in place of a sermon, they'd have uh, a few of their folks that were here um, share their stories with us. And this particular year, it was uh, six, seven years ago, it was the Sunday after bonus day. Since I didn't have to sing on the praise team that day, I was sitting in the back where Stephen is now, running the soundboard and hiding back there like I usually like to do. It was time for the sharing portion in the second service, and a few different people got up to speak um, than had spoken in the first service. And one young woman got up and spoke of her life-changing experience at Teen Challenge and was talking very expectantly about her upcoming graduation. As she was telling her story, it became very clear that she didn't have any family that lived in the state, and none of her family from out of state would be able to come to her graduation. Now, believe it or not, at six foot four and, you know, sometimes around 250 pounds, I can be a little sentimental. And I got choked up. I'm sitting back there, and I'm like, oh, well, that's unfortunate. Um, and then she said this. She said, my mom can't even afford the $460 for the plane ticket. She wasn't asking anyone for the money. It just came up as part of her story. It was at that point where being a little choked up turned into a full-on cry. I was bawling back there, again, hiding behind the computers. All right, youth group, what was the number? All right, those of you good in math, what's 10% of 4,600? 460, all right. That's what I thought to myself. Wow, that's 10% of the bonus I just got two days ago. Maybe I should pay for that ticket. Then I had that little battle with yourself that you have every once in a while. You know, the bad Jim was over here saying, <laughs> that's your money. That's your bonus money. Maybe you really should buy a ticket. You know, we went back and forth like that for a little while. And then a voice in my head started saying, write the check. Write the check. Write the check. Is that my stomach growling? I usually skip breakfast on Sunday mornings, and I'm you know, kind of sitting back there. And again, in bold writing here, it says, write the check. Um, I finally realized that it wasn't a 20-something-year-old woman that was speaking up here. It was God speaking from this very pulpit, and he was speaking directly to me. Write the check. I reached for my checkbook, and it wasn't there. God's telling me to write a check. I don't even have my checkbook. Oh, good, Liz is here. I ran to find Liz afterwards. I need your checkbook. I'll, I'll explain it later. And I wrote that check for that woman that morning. I had a chance to talk with her after the service. And I don't know that I'd ever seen anyone so grateful for something that I'd given them um, ever before. I was being used by God as an answer to prayer for her. It was a very special moment for both of us. Now, God uses all sorts of ways to speak to teach and correct us. That Sunday, he used a woman from Teen Challenge to correct my thinking and teach me that nothing that I have is really mine, including that annual bonus that I'd been spending all those years. Ever since that day, I haven't had to look very far to find something to spend that extra or that 10% on. God has always made it very clear what needs to be done, a ministry need, a missionary need, foundation for growth, or helping fund someone's missionary trip to Thailand last year. I'm not going to lie to you, I still love bonus day. It's one of my favorite days. It's, you know, coming up really soon. <laughs> um, but I find myself looking more forward to what God's going to do with that 10% than what I'm going to do with the 90. And like I said, it's coming up. It's February 8th. I know the day. Um, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do with that this year.